guess I'm going to be. <laughs> you can almost see the whites of their eyes. <laughs> so, any place I look at the G, I'm over Chicago now, we get pretty thick and with planes. It's getting dangerous. I think I'm going to leave and head back for Elgin. So the only place that I could see that was open was underneath the belly. All along the side, over above me or any place I looked ahead of me were planes. So I drove under the belly of it, and just as I was diving uh, uh, underneath the gondola, these Germans were, geez, they were leaning way up. They were shaking with a fist at me. You could see it so plain. And then I saw immediately why I almost tripped off the antenna. I just missed it. They had this antenna hanging around with an iron ball on it. <laughs> I just missed that thing. And, I, and then for about three weeks, I was frightened because I was instructing students and I thought I was going to lose my livelihood because I thought they got my number. But luckily, they didn't get my number because they had a number right across the upper wing and on the tail and underneath the lower one. So they missed my number. I'd have been reported sure that they Oh, I have to tell you one other incident. Oh, maybe it's you got all the <laughs> I caught a fellow to fly in South Elgin. Uh, his name was Les Dierkin. And he had an old Canadian Canuck plane. And uh, uh, Ralph Wilson, that had uh, Wilson Airport on River Road, called me one day. He said, Bill, you're closer to he than I am. He said, could you give him instructions? I said, well, I suppose I can. So I went over to see him. He was near Hops Corners. He was on Hops Farms. He was flying out of the uh, cow pasture. And it was such an old plane, the fabric was so rotten on the thing. If you go like that, your finger go right straight through it. It was so rotten. Now, why I have flew a plane that had rotten? fabric like that on my, every so often we'd be, I'd be giving them instruction to hunk a fabric and fly off. <laughs> Why the whole thing didn't fly off? I don't know. <laughs> so what he would do is tell the farm kid to go in and ask the mother for some cloth. Well, she didn't know what kind of cloth. She'd give him colored cloth or any kind. He had, ni had nitrates, don't so we? We'd come a patch out and put it over the hole and take it up and then we'd go flying. <laughs> So, I don't know how many holes or patches that look like a patch quilt. <laughs> with all these patches on all different colors, but we still fly, and, and, and the plane flew good. It had dual aileron sensitive. I like the way it flew, just so the wings wouldn't come off the family. <laughs> so then, one day, I had them on landing and takeoffs, and uh, all of a sudden, here we are, to the end of the airport, just getting near the end of the airport, and there's a road down alongside there, right up here. Then all of a sudden, the, the motor flew to pieces. The whole cylinder blew off, and of course, the, the crankshaft went right through the side of the motor, and, and the intake and exhaust, everything went with us there. I mean, the whole motor was shot. It was made a wreck. <laughs> I grabbed the controls, and I would, that one time I was going to dive under electric wires. But I couldn't. There's cars parked all the way along the road. Those days you always had cars wait for a crack up, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and so the only thing I could do with, with not much forward speed to get over the electric wires, which I wanted to do or either over or underneath, I pulled back on that stick. Just had enough forward speed to get over the electric wire, wire, but by the time I got over the whole plane was stalled, boy, down we go. We went right down. And the lucky thing was a slew, and it was so soft, we just buried that plane in the slew. <laughs> I, I remember I broke the joystick off and bumped my head on the cowling. That, that was the fastest stop I ever made in my life. And when we got out, we almost had a swim or, or, or weight of stuff out of this here slew. And in order to get the plane out of slew, and here she was, down in the mud, just like that. She just stopped, just like that. So we had to get a rope from a farmer, and uh, then we had a whole bunch of people there. They helped us pull that thing out by hand. And there was nothing done. The prop wasn't busted. And you had the prop was buried in that mud. The prop wasn't busted. Landing gear was busted. There's nothing broken. No <laughs> that, that was so soft. So, well, then he decided he wanted to uh, 
get rid of the plane because his motor was all shot, and then he saw an ad down in uh, Texas for American Eagle. So he flies down, e uh, down to get the American Eagle, and he figured he could solo there. He hadn't sold it yet when I was giving him instruction. He figured he could solo there and fly it back. I thought, boy, you will never fly that. He didn't have that cross-country uh, oh. flying or anything. I figured he'd never find your way back. <laughs> so I have got the letter from him. Well, he was taking instructions. He was doing pretty good. But gee, about two days later, I got a telegram. Come and get my plane. I'm in, where was that? Cherryville, Kansas. <laughs> so that telegram came about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. By 5 o'clock, I was on a train heading for Kansas City, and then I had to take another train from there. It was right near the Oklahoma border. So I got down to him, and I asked him, what was wrong with him? Oh, he said, I found out that I couldn't fly the plane back alone. I never had any cross-country flying. So he hired the pilot to fly him back. And they had so many forced landings on the way back. This last one, he said, Bill, I thought that was our end. We landed in the wheat field in a windy day. Motor had quit. And so the pilot said, hell with it. I'm going back. He said, let this go. Let's go plane. So I got to bring, have to bring that plane back. So then the taxi driver took us off to where the plane was. And so I said to Les Durkin, I said, what's wrong with him? Oh, he said, I don't know, that motor quits ever so often. <laughs> so I said, let's start her up. So I started it up, and it was awful rough. So I said, gee, I, I opened the throttle. She'd run faster, but rough. So I said, that's ignition. So I shut the thing off. So I got out the carburetor and took off the cover of the breaker points on the magneto. Uh, not the carburetor, the magneto. And here I found out the breaker points weren't breaking. You'd pull a prop through, and I'd watch the breaker points, and they just leave a wee little space. But what happened, whenever the motor would get hot and this magneto would get hot, then they'd stick together. It wouldn't break at all. The motor would break. So I said, oh, my God, I see your trouble where your trouble is. I have no shim gauge or anything, but I can guess at how far to open up the points if I have a wrench. Taxi driver, he's waiting for us to take off so he can see whether we're going to fly or not. <laughs> so I said, do you have any wrenches? Well, what I needed was a tiny little wrench, you know, like needle wrench. No, all he had was a screwdriver and a pliers. So I said, okay, give me a screwdriver and pliers. So with a screwdriver, I'd get against that nut and the pliers, and I'd hit it and hit it, and I'd break that nut loose. Finally, I got the lock nut loose, and then I could adjust the other one so where I could break it, where I could probably gauge about 22,000 of an inch, and then I'd set the lock nut back again real tight, because I didn't want that coming loose again when we're flying. So uh, uh, I got it all tight. Oh, and then we start the motor. These are going to be beautiful. <laughs> the thing, thing ran beautiful all the way home. And uh, oh, we had to stop two places on the way home, and they had, and no, they had no map. And I'm supposed to find my way all the way from her, and he had no map. I said, how in the heck can you? Well, the pilot took it with him, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I had, had, had the general direction from, from uh, uh, Kansas, just north of the Oklahoma border, to Elgin. Well, we we're doing pretty well. At Hannibal, Missouri, I think I saw the name on the on the water tank. See, but I had no map, but I had an idea where Hannibal, Missouri was, so I headed in the way of, uh, of Elgin. So finally I get in this territory where I should really begin to know the territory, and I would run short of gas at Genoa, Illinois. I was just a little bit too far north. But I sat down in Genoa, and uh, then I got some gas and, and headed down for, for Elgin. Then I'll tell you what happened. I, I taught him to fly then. He comes where he could fly. And one day, I was still instructing students at the Elgin Airport. Now he's flying out of this cow pasture. And here, all of a sudden, I hear the, the bearing go out on him. He was up there quite a ways in the air, and he's right above the airport. Bang, 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 bang. I thought, gee, now I wonder if he's going to shut that motor off. I hope he does before the connecting rod goes through the, uh, through the motor. But he did. He shut it off. Now I'm going to see uh, how good a 
turbulency was in landing. <laughs> Without a motor, he made a nice landing in, in uh, the airport. And uh, then, I don't know, he had work done on the thing. And, and uh, then he tried up the motor, and he didn't have much oil pressure. He said, oh my God, here I got the motor fixed up again, not enough oil pressure on there. And he liked to have the plane down in his field in South Belgium. And uh, then he said, Bill, would you fly the plane down there? I said, yeah, I'll fly it down there, but don't blame me if that motor goes out again. And I'm up there, so uh, I took the thing off. And after I got up in the airway, I throttled her back as much as I could on the come uh, less oil pressure that it shouldn't have. And so I, I got it back on. Well, he got it all fixed up again. Then what he was doing, he didn't even have, a, I don't think, a private pilot's license. And he was instructing students. He's supposed to have a transport. He was instructing students out of this field. And he, he wasn't charging them as much as we were charging for students. So he was getting students. But he got in trouble with that. And one day, he was coming in for a landing with this plane. And here the hops, hired man, had a load of manure. And he was just driving a team in the load of manure through this here cow pasture with this guy land. Why he didn't see this, the team of horses and, and, and uh, manure spreader down there, and he comes down and he lands right on top of the manure spreader. <laughs> <laughs> right on top of the manure spreader. He almost killed the hired man. <laughs> and, uh, a team ran away. <laughs> and, uh, his plane was wrecked. And a hired man was in the Elgin Hospital for months <laughs> before he was out of the hospital. So that, that will kind of end in their complaint. Say, I'm way over. I'm sorry. I, I ran the <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Then. Bill, when you went cross country, and you, needed, and you went cross country like you came from Kansas, and you needed fuel, what'd you do? Just come to a town and get oh, fuel? I landed one place, sir, in Missouri. I was so short of gas, and uh, they had no airports those days except at the larger cities. I saw a nice field down uh, near uh, Main Road, so I sat in this field, and lo and behold, the hogs had been in there and rooted it all up, and you couldn't see it from the air, and that was so doggone rough in there that uh, I was afraid they were going to break the landing gear, but I had to get the gasoline and put in it. When I took off, I really squashed the ball. You get gas from the farmers, I suppose, huh? The what? You get gas from the farmers? Is that no, right? No, 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 they, no. Somebody always come with an automobile, because they figure you have trouble. There's always oh, somebody stopped with an automobile. And they'd be happy to run into town and get the gas wagon. And the gas wagon would come out there. Thank you. Uh, hold it. No, I, I didn't know. 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 1935. So either depression went on, or either keep my airplane, or my, uh, I was going to get a wife then. So I had to decide against the airplane or the wife. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I the wife. But I had one fellow one time. What? Well, just this would be only part of a minute. Uh, over here at Wander Lake, there were selling lots at Wander Lake. Now, where's that? To north of McHenry someplace. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I knew they were going to sell lots there, and there would be a lot of people there. So I'm going to go over there, and I have the fellow that, now he's a real estate dealer in, in uh, Chicago. So he went along with me to sell tickets. So I landed uh, alongside the lake there. Oh, my God. Somebody, some farmer plowed that field over and they never went over with a disc or a drag or something, but the grass was coming up and it looked like a nice lawn. <laughs> and that was so rough. And then I said to this ticket seller, I'm not going to fly out of here because I said, I'll wreck my plane, I can't do it. So we just sat around there a while, walked around the lake, and finally I took off to go back to Elgin again. Oh, we were going halfway to Elgin. And he's sitting, he's in the front cockpit, and all of a sudden he hollers something to me, and I throw him over to find out what he wanted. He says, your, your left landing gear is hanging way down. 
<laughs> and I can't see it from my cockpit, their wings hide so I couldn't see it. Nor was I happy that he told me about it. He said, he said, you got to think it. He said, maybe if I crawl out on a wing and I take my belt, he says, you, you take your belt off, which I did. He strapped the both belts together, and then he laid on his belly, looking over the front end of the wing, and he's trying to lasso <laughs> the, the landing gear, figuring he could bring it back up. And, uh, and, and well, he couldn't make it. I had travel motor all the way down so he wouldn't get the slipstream from the prop. And then, you know, I was afraid he might fall off, so finally I told him to get back in the cockpit. <laughs> I got back to Elton. I was just happy that I knew that, that I had no wheel or everything hanging down. I had one wheel to land on. So I shut off my motor when I got near the Elgin Airport and figured I wouldn't need the motor anymore. I shut it off entirely because I didn't want to touch fire in case we drove on our back. So then I landed on the one wheel. I landed that way against the wind. I was doing fine. I was rolling, rolling along, rolling along until I lost speed. And then I ate around, couldn't hold that other wing up anymore. And that wing goes right down to the ground. And, uh, broken landing gear come right up through my wing. But I, I didn't go over on my... I didn't go over on my... So I thought we stop it. Yeah. <laughs> I have pictures here of things if you want to see them. Yes. Okay, Bill, don't go away. No? Okay. Uh, you know, every time, uh, I remember when you spoke the last time, it was just as fascinating. And I think everybody here will, you know, echo that. And, uh, you know, I can't get over some of the things you've gone through in flight. You know, if we anywhere we're at, way halfway near that, we'd probably give up flying. <laughs> But, the, you know, I, I think the challenges they had back then is what, you know, essence we still look for today, in a way, and probably that's why we fly. Um, you know, we can't thank you enough for your, for your um, personal memories, you know, the early aviation history in this area, and it was just fascinating. Now, we have a little testimonial for you. This is a certificate of appreciation for Bill, and it says, Certificate of Appreciation awarded to William H. Klingenberg, Jr. from EAA Chapter 790, Barrington, Illinois, for special presentation of personal, personal aviation memoirs and history in the Barrington area. And it also says at the bottom, this 22nd day of October, 1985, honorary member. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I'm glad to be here with you. Thank you.